Greetings everyone and welcome back to this special broadcast where I've been going through Gipp's Understandable History of the Bible book by Brother Samuel C. Gipp and we've been going through chapter 8 about Westcott and Hort and last time we left off on page 238 and we're going to pick up with Westcott's Communal Living and this is uh, going to be part 6 of the chapter and I know last time I said that Part 5 was Part 6, but this is actually going to be Part 6, so let's get started here on the subtopic from Westcott and Hort, Chapter 8, from Gipps' Understandable History of the Bible Book, uh, with Westcott's Communal Living, on page 238, and it says here, Few of Bishop Westcott's 20th century supporters know the true thoughts and intents of his heart. If they did, they would know that he was an advocate of communal living. Let the record speak for itself. His son, Arthur, stated in his book, Life and Letters of Brooke Foss Westcott, in later years of his Harrow residence, approximately 1868, my father was very full of the idea of a coenobium, and that's C-O-E-N-O-B-I-U-M, co Eniobium, and it says Arthur's footnote for the word coeniobium states simply community life, which I'm not sure why he didn't just use that word instead of trying to make us pronounce this uh, this word coeniobium. Let's just say community life. Um, and continue on, uh, Arthur says every form of luxury was to him abhorrent, and he viewed with alarm an increasing tendency amongst all classes of society to encourage extravagant display and wasteful self-indulgence. His own extreme simplicity of life is well known to all his friends. He looked to the family and not the individual for the exhibition of the simple life. His views upon this subject are accessible to all who care to study them. I only wish to put it on record that he was very much in earnest in the matter and felt that he had not done all he might have for its furtherance. And that's from the book, uh, page uh, 263 and 264 uh, from Arthur Westcott's book. Continuing on, on the idea of the coenio uh, Bishop Westcott's socialism bordered very close to communism as we see by his own description of what a coniobium was to be. It would consist primarily of an association of families bound together by common principles of life, of work, of devotion, subject during the time of voluntary cooperation to central control and united by definite obligations such as a corporate life would be best realized under the conditions of collegiate uh, union uh, with the hall and schools and chapel with a common income, though not common property, and an organized government, but the sense of fellowship and the power of sympathy, though they would be largely developed by the, uh, these, would re uh, yet remain vigorous whenever and in whatever form com uh, combination in the furtherance of the general ends was possible, indeed, complete isolation from the mass of society would defeat the very objects of the institution. These objects, the conquest of luxury, the disciplining of intellectual labor, the consecration of every frag fragment of life by religious exercises would be expressed in a threefold obligation, an obligation to poverty, an obligation to study, an obligation to devotion. And uh, Brother Gibbs says, emphasis mine. <laughs> and that's uh, from uh, the book, uh, page 264 of that uh, book, uh, the one from Arthur uh, Westcott. All right, continuing on, uh, Brother Gibb writes, little did the esteemed professor realize that the college students of a hundred years later would be more than happy to turn his dream into a reality, right? <laughs> so, and we know that communism never works. All right, so continuing on here, turn the page. 
All right, so Arthur uh, viewed the establishment of the Coeniobium with much fear and trembling. Westcott's children were assured of its future reality quite often. And this is uh, Arthur speaking again. He writes, My own recollections of the Coeniobium are very vivid. Whenever we children showed signs of greediness or other selfishness, we were assured that such things would be unheard of in the Coneobium. Uh, there the greedy would have no second portions of desirable puddings. We should, not, uh, we should not there be allowed a choice of meats, but should be constrained to take which was uh, judged to be best for us. Hmm. We viewed the establishment of the Coneobium uh, with gloomy apprehension, not quite sure whether it was within the bounds of practical politics or not. I, my, I was myself inclined to believe that it really was coming and that we, with the Bensons, maybe, and Hortz and a few other families, would find ourselves living in a community life. I remember confiding to a younger brother that I had overheard some conversation which convinced me that the Coneobium was an event of the immediate future, and that a site had been selected for it in Northamptonshire. I even pointed out Petersborough on the map, and that's from IBID, page 264 and 265. Westcott's fascination with communal living was not a passing fancy. In a letter to his old college friend, Dr. E. W. Benson, dated November 24, 1868, Dr. Westcott states his regrets that the Coneobium had not yet been established and wonders if he wouldn't have done better to have pursued the matter further. This is what he writes to his friend, uh, Dr. E. W. Benson. My dear Benson, alas, I feel most deeply that I ought not to speak one word about the Coneobium. Uh, we, one seems to be <clears throat> entangled in the affairs of life, the work must be for those who have a fresh life to give. Yet sometimes I think that I have been uh, faithless to call, uh, which might have grown distinct if I had listened. And that's from the book, page 265 of that book from um, uh, Arthur. And uh, so Brother Gibb continues on. He writes, two years later, he was still promoting the idea through articles in a periodical entitled Contemporary, as he explains in another letter to Benson dated March 21st, 1870. The paper on the Coneobium will appear, I think, in the next number of the Contemporary. It was a trial to me not to send it to you and Lightfoot and Wordsworth for criticism, but on the whole, I thought it best to venture for myself and speak simply what I feel. If anything is to come of the idea, it will be hand handled variously, and something is gained even by incompleteness. On the true reconciliation of classes, I have said a few words which are, I hope, intelligible. And that's I bid page 265 and 266. Two years after he'd made it, young Arthur's na naive-sounding uh, 1868 prediction of the establishing of such a coneobium in Petersboro seemed almost prophetic. It must be noted that this letter puts to rest that lame defense that Westcott and Hort's defenders are forever making about the foolish ideas of youth. In 1870, one year before he sat on the Revision Committee, Westcott was still pursuing his communistic heaven. <laughs> in December 1868, Dr. Westcott became examining chaplain in the Diocese of Petersburg. Scary thought, he writes in parentheses. Just prior to the move, he wrote Benson, the Coneobium comes at least one step nearer, and that's Ibid page 267. <laughs> Uh, apparently, uh, Westcott was hoping that he would be able to use this position to impose his socialistic nightmare 
on his unsuspecting parishioners, young Arthur's fears seemed somewhat realized. The move to Petersboro was a great venture of faith on my father's part. He had a large family of, to educate, and yet he exchanged the comparative opulence of a Harrow house master for the precarious income attached to a uh, cannery in an impoverished chapter. Our uh, manner of life was already adapted to the idea of the coniobium in its strict simplicity, so the only luxury that could be abolished was meat for breakfast, which, however, was retained as a Sunday treat. And that's I bid page 305. Thus, we see a side of Dr. Westcott which is not to publicized by his worshippers. Uh, yet it was there nonetheless. In addition to his desire to see the authorized version replaced, the Church of England Romanized and a college coniobium established, he had one other great driving force, the fanciful ab abolition of war. And that leads us into the next topic, uh, Westcott's Peace Movement. So here we go, Westcott's Peace Movement. <clears throat> World peace is a noble cause, and no true Christian loves war. A Bible believer takes the premillennial view and realizes that war is caused by the sinful nature of mankind. And that's uh, reference James 4.1. He understands that this will, be, this will all be changed at Christ's return, Philippians 3.21. Therefore, a Bible believer realizes that he is not going to be able to abolish war. A Bible rejecter, who has chosen the post-millennial uh, millennial viewpoint, cannot allow himself to believe that mankind is bad. He must find a way to show that man is basically good. <laughs> All men must be brothers in his eyes. Brothers, he assumes, will just naturally work toward peace. <laughs> uh, this is the view of every world leader today, right? This is the view of every New Ager. This was the view of Brooks, or Brooke Foss Westcott. Westcott, a post-millennial socialist, had this to say concerning the brotherhood of man in, regarding, or in regard to instituting peace on earth. Christianity rests upon the central fact that the word became flesh. This fact establishes not only a brotherhood of men, but also a brotherhood of nations. For history has shown that nations are an element in the fulfillment of the divine counsel by which humanity advances towards its appointed end. And that's found in Ibid, volume 2, page 22. What should these brothers do to help establish peace on earth? Is the question. According to Westcott, it's simple. We can at once recognize the part which the Christian society is called upon to take with regard to three great measures which tend to peace, meditation, arbitration, and ultimately disarmament, and at least, at, at least silently uh, work for them. Hmm. And that's I bid page two, 22 and 23. Combined action is any way uh, possible for the bringing about of a simultaneous reduction of the armaments, I bid page 18. Once again, the Cambridge professor is ahead of his time. Disarmament has been the cry of liberal, pro-communist college students for two decades. Every liberty-hating news journalist shares Westcott's hope. Strange it is that as the peace movement of the 1960s was led by a minister with the exact same philosophy about... Uh, world peace, <laughs> and there has never been a cause where disarmament ever prevented a war, right? But like all lost do-gooder politicians, Westcott was going to allow facts to uh, wasn't going to allow facts to taint the rosy view he had of his ideal. He wanted an arbitration board made up of the Christian society, so and arbitration board made up of the Christian society to decide international policy concerning disarmament uh, quotas. His first envisioned, uh, he first envisioned 
England and the United States submitting to this idea, assuming then that the rest of the world would be forced to follow. The participation in the United States is absolutely necessary to any one world or peace movement. The old League of Nations died an early death because a wise Congress refused to allow the United States to join. By 1945, the famous socialist Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, had better luck uh, cunning the U U.S. into the United Nations, and world peace has been purchased ever since by the blood, money, and freedoms of the citizens of the United States of America. Brooke Foss Westcott would have been proud. He prophesied, The United States and England are already bound uh, so closely together by their common language and common descent that an arbitration treaty, which shall exclude the thought of war, a civil war, and then we got a little note down here at the bottom. It says, Westcott's use of the term civil war to describe any future war that might occur between the United States and England shows that he never really considered England's claim on the United on the U.S. to be broken by the 1776 War for Independence. He did not recognize or respect the independence of the United States of America. This man is not our friend. All right, so we'll go back up to uh, what uh, Westcott says here. He says, Between them seems to be within measurable distance uh, when once the general principle of aberration um, has been adopted by two great nations, it cannot but be that the example will be followed, and then at last, however remote the vision may seem, disarmament will be a natural consequence of the acceptance of a rational and legal method of uh, settling national disputes. And that's from Arthur Westcott's book, Life and Letters of Brooke Foss Westcott, New York, 1903, Volume 2, page 23. Continuing on, Brother Gip writes, Westcott even felt that world peace would be worth an ecumenical movement. Other congregate uh, uh, subjects were touched upon the proposed uh, permanent treaty of aber Tration between the United States and Great Britain, the significance of war as extreme uh, outcome of that spirit of selfish competition which follows from the acceptance of a material standard of well-being, the desirability of seeking cooperation with the movement on the part of the Roman and Greek churches, but it seemed best to confine immediate action to a single point on which there was a complete agreement. I bid page 19. Westcott would feel comfortable with Bill Clinton, Ted Turner, and Desmond Tutu in his blind socialistic drive to dominate the people of the world with what he called peace. He, he viewed that goal as being of the utmost importance. The proposal to work for the simultaneous reduction of European armament is definite and deals with an urgent peril. Such an disarmament would secure the lasting and honorable peace with uh, which the leaders of Europe have shown lately, once and again, that they sincerely desire. We are all sensible of the difficulties by which the question of disarmament is beset, but we cannot admit that they are insuperable. And that's Ibid, page 19. All this was to be done, of course, in the name of Jesus Christ. Like all totalitarian socialists, Westcott felt that he was simply trying to bring to pass Luke 2.14 as he misinterpreted it. He truly considered himself a man with whom God was pleased, as that verse has had been mistranslated in the Revised Version. Like all confessed holy men who have ever murdered in the name of God, Westcott used Jesus Christ as his excuse for his socialist desires. The question of international relations has not hitherto been considered in the light of the Incarnation, and until this has been done, 
I do not see that we can look for the establishment of that peace which we heralded at the Nativity. And that's Ibid, uh, to page 23. And that is where we'll lead off, leave off for today. And next time we'll pick up with Westcott's Faith uh, on page 246 of the third edition of Gipps' Understandable History of the Bible book. Amen. So that will be next time, starting with Westcott's Faith. So hope you join me next time for that. And this is the cover of the book. This is the third edition. And I know he's done a, a newer edition since then. So uh, you can either pick up this copy or get a copy of the newer one, which uh, one day hopefully I'll end up doing. So he's had a lot of stuff to it. Amen. So that's Gip's Understandable History of the Bible by Samuel C. Uh, C. Gip, THD. Amen. All right. So, Lord willing, see you next time. Bye for now.